do that here. Maybe the day I argue. Welcome, everybody. Um, uh, we don't have a huge audience today, uh, but we also um, stream ev these Pitchup Supreme Court series online. And so um, for the uh, panelists, always remember that uh, we're speaking to both the audience and the online audience. Um, uh, one announcement, um, this um, uh, Supreme Court series is co-sponsored by the PTAB Bar Association. And the PTAB Bar Association has an annual conference uh, this March 14th and 15th uh, here in DC at the Ritz-Carlton. Um, and so uh, that's March 14th and 15th. That's the PTAB Bar Association's annual conference. That's the one announcement I have to start off. So I'd like to welcome everyone um, here today to discuss uh, the arguments in Return Mail Incorporated versus United States Postal Service. So this is a patent case um, that was uh, argued this morning. Um, and it was a, a lively argument. Um, and so basically I'll, I'll just give a brief summary of um, what led up to this point. So Return Mail Incorporated has a patent um, that covers the barcodes used in um, postal delivery and they sued the US Postal Service. And uh, in response, the US Postal Service um, challenged that patent under the America Invents Act's covered business method uh, procedure, and uh, they won that case. The, the patent was um, overturned. It was uh, uh, not valid any longer. The Federal Circuit uh, affirmed that ruling, and then at the Supreme Court, uh, the argument is basically that the um, government, the Postal Service in this case, doesn't have um, the right to make use of the procedures in the uh, AIA. And so um, this court really, uh, this case really is about uh, whether the definition is whether a government is a person uh, who may petition to institute review proceedings under the AIA. And so a lot of this case turns on um, what source do we need to look to um, to define what a person is. Um, and so we'll, we'll hear a lot of different um, ideas about how we can uh, determine what a person is. And if the government is a person, they're allowed to uh, proceed at the AIA, at the PTAB. And if they're not a person, they aren't. Um, so th this is really all about, uh, is the government a person or not for purposes of uh, the AIA review? Um, so we have a, a great panel today. Um, to my left, my immediate left, uh, is Martine Ciccone. She's with Aiken Gump. Uh, she, uh, submitted an amicus brief in support of the petition petitioners. Um, on, to her left is Charles Don. He's with R Street Institute, and he uh, submitted an amicus brief on the side of the respondents. Um, and to his left is Lizzie Besky. Uh, she's a WCL professor. She's his Fed Courts. She's here uh, to provide a little, little non-patent insight uh, into what is really a non-patent case. Um, so uh, with that brief introduction, let me uh, turn it over to Martine to uh, give us the respondents, uh, oh sorry, for the petitioner's argument. Basically what were they arguing 
um, for why the government should not be considered a person under the AIA. Um, great, thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, so I think it is important to point out that this is an argument. The, the question that uh, was at issue in the Supreme Court case uh, arose fairly late in this case and, in fact, was not briefed by the petitioner. Um, the question whether the government can um, use the particular proceeding under the AIA um, as a person um, was something that came up in the dissent by uh, Judge Newman in the Federal Circuit. Um, so uh, essentially, their arguments in the Supreme Court sort of teed off uh, Judge Newman's dissent, which was really, um, at a high level, sort of twofold. First, that there's a longstanding presumption that the word person, um, when used in statutes, does not apply to the government, um, and which is connected with the Dic Dictionary Act of definition of person, but um, also just a judicial construction. Um, and then secondly, and sort of uh, in relation to that, you really couldn't use the, the, you couldn't interpret the term person to apply <coughs> to the government here because um, the AIA is, is sort of a, a balanced statute where um, an entity that wants to challenge a patent uh, because they essentially want to use the technology um, gets a way to do it efficiently through this, um, this administrative mechanism. But if they lose under that administrative mechanism, they are no longer allowed to claim patent invalidity as a defense to infringement. Essentially, they are a stop from doing so um, in the court when they're sued for infringement if they continue to use the technology or for their previous infringement of the technology. Um, but the federal government is a unique patent defendant, if you even want to call it a patent infringement defendant. Um, the statute that provides for uh, suing the government um, for patent infringement claims um, is specific to the Court of Federal Claims and it's under Section 1498. And that section, that mechanism was not called out as one of the mechanisms or one of the, um, one of the types of suits for which someone would be stopped from claiming patent invalidity. So essentially, Judge Newman and the petitioners say, well, how can the federal government get, have it both ways? How can they be a person for purposes of using this um, administrative mechanism, but then they don't have, uh, they don't, uh, in, they don't, they're not subject to the same risk, which is at the risk of estoppel, um, because their their uh, suits against the government are not included among the suits for which uh, the party that lost uh, at the PTO is estopped. Um, so that's essentially um, the argument made by petitioners. The presumption against using person to incorporate the federal government. Um, should apply here, does apply here, and there's nothing affirmative um, in, the te in the statutory text that suggests that Congress meant to incorporate the federal government within the term person as um, would be required when this presumption applies. And in fact, given that the government is not covered by the estoppel provision, the statutory scheme as a whole suggests that person should not encompass the government, they should not be allowed to use this procedure. So I think um, at a high level, in a, in a, in a nutshell, that's, that's their argument. Um, Obviously, it's more detailed than that, but that's a kind of 10,000-foot overview. Great. Let me give a little background on, on um, the Dictionary Act. So th this is the Dictionary Act um, right here, and it says that any act of Congress, unless uh, context indicates otherwise, and so that's a big part of the argument here, is that a, uh, the word person includes these things, but not the government. Um, so basically, it's, it states that uh, an act of Congress, a statute, um, Person, if it's used, does not mean government unless the context indicates otherwise. And um, petitioner's argument is that, well, the context does not in indicate otherwise. Uh, there's nothing in the uh, uh, legislative history which indicates that um, the Congress wanted a uh, person to mean something different. And respondent says just the opposite. And so let's turn over to Charles to say uh, why uh, the government thinks that uh, in this case, um, person under the AIA includes the government. Yep, thanks. Um, there we go. Thank you, Jonas, and thank you for having me at this panel. Um, so I'll just talk about um, what the government um, was arguing, at least to the best of my ability, um, and I'm assuming we'll talk about yep. the argument itself later. Yes. Um, so the government basically makes two arguments, um, at least by my reading, 
um, a textual argument and then a sort of practical effects argument. Um, I'm actually going to do these in reverse order because I think that the practical effects argument helps us set the stage for the case too a little bit. Um, the practical effect that the government says is if the government is not allowed to use the AIA review provisions, but everybody else is allowed to use it, then the government is actually strangely disadvantaged in its ability to deal with patents. And this has kind of two effects. The first is that it puts the government in a bad position. If the government, for example, wants to engage in some sort of innovative practice or it use some technology or it wants to um, you know, engage in some sort of regulatory practice that implicates patents, then the government is unable to clear the field of patents that might get in the way, even if those patents it believes to be invalid, whereas any other private party would be allowed to do so. And so that, I think, really motivates why the government cares about this sort of situation, because the government is a user of technology in the same way that you know, um, businesses might be a user of technology, in addition to being the government and having regulatory functions. So that leads the government to a textual argument about whether or not the Patent Act actually supports the idea that um, the government should be a person with respect to being able to engage in these AIA review proceedings. And the government basically points out that Throughout the Patent Act, there's very little consistency in the way that the, the word person is used. On the one hand, there are provisions of the Patent Act that you know, do draw a line between the government and other persons. I think that the uh, patent marking statute was one example. Um, there was another one that's not coming to mind. But there are other places where the Patent Act does use the word person to basically include the government. For example, the government is allowed to apply for patents. So all the provisions that talk about a person um, having certain obligations or rights as to um, obtaining patents obviously obtain to the, uh, um, apply to the government as well. There are other provisions, for example, the provision for submitting um, prior art for consideration after or for, for placing in the file after, um, during examination or after examination. Those also use the word person and there's, I, I think the understanding is that the government is allowed to take advantage of those provisions as well. So you have some provisions that say that the government is, allowed, is a person for purposes of the Patent Act and other provisions that say the government is not a person for purposes of the Patent Act. It seems then that the best thing to do is to just evaluate the statutory provision on its own and figure out what is the you know, appropriate interpretation of person for the AAA purposes. And because of the practical effect, the government argues that it should be treated as a person there. Great. Um, so that, that's basically the stage we're at um, with the arguments. Before we turn to the actual arguments today, let me turn to Lizzie Besky, um, WCL's own federal courts expert, um, really to explain or to try to explain what is the court's interest in this question? This is a pretty narrow question. Like, is the government a person for purposes of the AIA? Why does the court um, take this case? Why, why? I mean, it's kind of a mystery. We, we discussed this earlier. What, are, what is your theory for what the court's doing here? Does it fit into a broader theme of what the court's uh, been doing lately? Well, it's really hard to know, honestly, given um, the fact, uh, as Martine pointed out, that the issue of uh, whether uh, the government can be a, a person for purposes of CBM review was not raised by any party. Um, and only surfaced uh, on, uh, in dissent uh, from the Federal uh, Circuit's opinion. Um, so to me, it's, it's a bit of a head scratcher uh, in that this is typically what we would have called a major vehicle problem. Uh, and it's something that, uh, it's, it's the kind of issue that if it's enough of a problem would be certain to recur. Um, I was surprised, uh, I just read the transcript uh, rather than attending, um, but I was surprised that that issue did not come up. Uh, it may be that the court uh, has so little to do uh, this term that uh, this was as good as anything. Um, it was interesting to see the uh, extent to which certain justices like uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh were very, very interested in um, a couple of the amicus briefs. Uh, one uh, they filed by the Cato Institute um, on behalf of petitioner really pitched up the kind of a unitary executive um, argument uh, that essentially for the government, uh, for a federal agency to be able to go into the patent um, PTAP before another federal agency to make this claim uh, and then ultimately to have that go to uh, a judicial uh, 
forum for review would have the government pitted against itself and the uh, decision rendered by an Article III court which would intrude upon uh, the president's Article II prerogative to settle all of the uh, different uh, agenda items in-house, essentially. Uh, but there was a, an inordinate amount of interest in that argument, um, I thought, uh, and less uh, interest, I thought, I, I'd be interested in Martine's standpoint, on, on in the uh, baseline presumption that uh, person excludes the government. I was all prepared to talk about that. They did not seem as interested in that question. Yeah, that's that's an interesting point. And I, I think, you know, reading through the briefs again, um, it struck me how many different presumptions are at issue here. And, and sometimes when you have the kind of battle of the presumptions, you get the the problem that there's a canon for everybody. And it may be that that, you know, they all sort of canceled each other out. Um, or it may be that, you know, these broader questions are just more interesting to the justices. Um, but uh, it, it is, it, you know, sort of tying back to the, the original question of why did they take this case, um, I, think that's, I think that's pretty interesting because my assumption, my guess, um, of course it's a black box, given the timing of this, which I think was maybe not the long conference, but shortly after, uh, it was a, you know, there was a sort of dearth of cases, as is typical, they can be a little bit low on cases at the beginning of the fall and, you know, wanting to be sure that all of the, uh, all of the calendars are filled up and that they're not sort of pressed at the end if they have too many cases towards the end of the year, that can be a problem. So, um, you know, it was a good digestible case, not a big issue, not one that's likely to break down on ideological lines. So um, sometimes these cases can be particularly um, appealing to the court and they may jump some of the vehicle problems that were not only, I'm sure, very clear uh, to the clerks, but uh, was leaned on very heavily by the government um, in its opposition. So. Uh, it may be that that was their intention to have a very nice, easily digestible statutory case, and they ended up with this massive question of executive authority. So sometimes, you know, all plans <coughs> plans can go awry there. Um, but but yeah, as for the presumption, I think uh, you know you sort of read the briefs and you say, well, you know, there's something for everybody in here, and and you know, picking one is just as good as picking another. So you may not you may not actually get as much traction as you thought you might. Um, so I guess just following up on this, um, the why did the court take the take the case question because it, it's something of a puzzle to me too. Um, putting this in the somewhat larger context of patent cases, the Supreme Court has been taking a lot of really weird patent cases recently. They've been taking a lot of cases on extraterritoriality, which has forced me to learn how to pronounce extraterritoriality. Um, it's a very difficult word. Um, they took oil states, which um, was what the third or fourth cert petition on the same issue. Um, and then they took SAS, which was about um, whether whether or not the, the PTAB had to decide the whole case or only the parts of it that it had granted institution on. So there is something of a puzzle of why the Supreme Court is picking the, the cases it picks. Now, one thing that I think is kind of indicative from oil states is that it's clear at this point that if patent owners have a way to knock on IPR, they will try over and over and over again and the, the impression that a lot of people got with regard to oil states was the Supreme Court took this because they just have to stop this. And one wonders whether or not they were worried about the same sort of phenomenon happening with regard to, um, to this sort of case. It's a little hard to see that because as the government acknowledged toward the end of its um, portion of argument, there are only 20 cases yeah. in which something like this has happened. So it's hard to see why this would have why this would be a recurring problem. Um, nevertheless, I, it, it does strike me as possible that the court is concerned about the administrative law of um, IPR and the PTO, possibly just because Gorsuch and um, other folks are very interested in it, but also because they know that they can't avoid the problem at this point. Yeah. Um, I guess since we started talking about the uh, the presumption question, should we just like get into the argument? Sure, do you want to, you want to add something? Well, I just yeah. wanted to say, I do think to an extent the court feels an institutional responsibility and um, the AIA is not a model of clear drafting uh, and it's never going to, to come before the court in, the, in a circuit split context. And so I think that there's some extra obligation that the court feels that it has to sort of superimpose clarity. And also, I do think that they acquire expertise 
in a given year when they invest in a case and that makes them perhaps more predisposed to accept kind of things that look like follow on cases. Mm -hmm. And they've had just a, a bunch of, of AIA cases recently and so they may feel in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there can be a little bit of an echo chamber effect too um, for the clerks, especially um, when you're a new clerk, um, seeing an issue that's come up repeatedly uh, you know, you might think, well, this is obviously an important issue. It was just in this court. So you can get a little bit of a, of a follow-on effect, um, both for the justices and, and for the court as a, as a broader institution. Okay. And I think also for litigants who may be more inclined to make petitions because there's been so many um, accepted. Obviously, there's <laughs> a monetary investment in petitioning. Um, and if you think you have a greater chance of success, you're more likely to do so. Great. So let's turn to the uh, argument today. So um, broadly, for everyone, um, what stuck out to you as um, interesting that the justices were really focused on that maybe you didn't anticipate or uh, things that they didn't focus on that you would have liked to see them focus more on? Um, anything that struck you as unusual or um, unique about the argument today? I, I have, I mean, I, I think picking up on um, the, the question of, you know, the the presumption of the the government not being a person. I feel like there were a couple of justices who did pick up on that, but in a sort of weird way. Um, the sense that I got from, from a lot of the questions was, well, it seems to make a lot of sense to let the government engage in these sorts of uh, in, in these sorts of proceedings. You know, what what's the difference between the government and and any other party? Um, Justice Breyer had this um delightfully long example in which he said, what if Google gets a patent? Interesting that he chose Google. Um, and the government wants to innovate in a space. Why can't the government clear out the patents in the space that it thinks are invalid um, in the same way that Joe Smith could, could do? What can the government do that's so, spe that's so special that Joe Smith can't do? Um, similarly, um, there were, I think Justice Sonoyor pointed out that the uh, that IPR and the AAA proceedings are the sort of defense tool. This is along the lines of the government's asymmetry argument that they should be able to do everything anybody else should be able to do. And Sonoyor says, why does it make sense to take away a defense tool from the government that everybody else seems to have? So you know, I think that there was a lot of reluctance to say that just as a practical matter, it makes a lot of sense for the government to say that the government is allowed to, isn't allowed to do this. But then the pushback that they get to when the government comes up to argue is, well, you do have the Dictionary Act, and you do have this presumption that the government is not a person unless there is a clear explanation of why it should be otherwise. Um, and particularly, I think this is where some of the um, executive power arguments that Justice um, Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh brought up came came into came to bear. They said, "Look, given that it's so weird to allow for government versus government litigation, wouldn't you think that there would have been an exceptionally clear statement um, that the government should be allowed to do this sort of thing?" So, you know, I think that there was something of a tension, and it really came um, it really came to me. You know, I, I think Justice Kagan really focused it toward the end when she asked. Should we really be following the presumption anyway? Just as a larger question, does it make any sense for us to follow you know, the presumption of the Dictionary Act when, as Justice Alito pointed out, there's no reason to believe that Congress actually thought about these sorts of issues. Should the court just figure out what it thinks um, would, be, would have been the intent of Congress at a blank slate? Or should we still stick with the, the statutory presumption? And I think that's going to be a big question that weighs on the justices' minds as they try to decide this. Well, I think. well, if you look at all of the cases um, cited uh, in petitioner's brief for this proposition that there's a presumption that person never includes the government, um, almost all of them are uniquely mired in the statutory context uh, in which they arise. And very few of them uh, really advert to the government as a sovereign um, motivating that presumption. Um, and one case that they relied on quite heavily sort of struck out at, stuck out at me, um, the Vermont agency versus U.S. X. Rel. Stevens case. It's a False Claims Act case from 2000 in which Justice Scalia said that a state is not a person who uh, can be sued under the False Claims Act, the key TAM provisions that enable 
uh, private uh, parties to sue um, uh, governments, uh, sue fraudulent actors. Um, and Scalia goes through the, the, of course, backdrop is the 11th Amendment that precludes uh, Congress from uh, abrogating uh, the state's immunity. But he goes through all this and concludes, ultimately, as a matter of statutory interpretation, that states cannot be party defendants, and then he drops a footnote. And the footnote, footnote 18, says, we don't even have to address the issue because it's not before us whether states can be party plaintiffs in False Claims Act cases. Now, of course, party plaintiffs are defined by the word person. And so he expressly kind of the court, the majority of the court then differentiates between the person, like the sovereign as party defendant and the sovereign as party plaintiff. And if you go through all the cases, there's a really, they all break down that way. Um, and I was very surprised that the court didn't kind of get more jazzed up about that because I was very jazzed. So uh, actually, um, this is a major issue in, uh, in the briefing and especially in the reply brief. And I think there's, uh, there's, there's definitely some import uh, to this idea that uh, the presumption has a particular application with respect to the government as defendant because liability on the part of the government affects taxpayers um, and also um, brings in all of these um, sovereign type issues uh, that motivate not and motivate treating the government differently. But, and it may be, I, I agree, there's a sort of uh, maybe lack of thought in some of these cases, but it is actually true that they have utilized the presumption in cases where there would be a benefit to the government as well. Not with a ton of thought to it and not with a, not with a, with a lot of um, question about, you know, does this make sense or not? Um, but uh, throughout, there have been situations where they, you know, and, and I completely agree, context is key in all of these cases and it's almost a presumption in name only because it really turns on what is the, you know, what is the broader context of the statute. But um, there are circumstances, and they're, they're pointed out in the reply brief, where um, the presumption has applied, even where the government is, even where the issue is inuring to the government's benefit. I don't know if Ms. You maybe, I mean, of, of, of Cooper, and, and I guess you were specifying with respect to plaintiff versus defendant, not necessarily benefit versus burden. So I think if you if you look in the category of benefit versus burden, there are cases where the presumption has applied, even where the government is seeking a benefit. So uh, Cooper. Um, uh, there, uh, there's a case called uh, Davis versus Pringle um, um, regarding the Bankruptcy Act. United States versus Fox is one that Judge Newman points out in her in her in her decision, where um, it's a question of whether um, the New York statute permitting a land conveyance to the um, whether a will should be read to permit a land conveyance to the federal government, um, or whether it would be not a person in that context. So, um, and, and even with respect to Stevens, I think it's interesting that. Well, the majority takes that view and says, you know, footnote, we're not going to decide. The dissent, which says that um, the state can be both, li can, could be considered a person as both a defendant and a plaintiff, does also make the point that, um, at least with respect to the enacting sovereign, the term does not generally apply. So even where, uh, I believe it's Justice Souter, Stevens, Stevens and is it Stevens in dissent in Stevens or Souter? Stevens in dissent in Stevens um, says, uh, general statutory references to persons are not normally construed to apply to the enacting sovereign, which in that case would be the federal government. Um, great. Uh, so let me let's talk more specifically about the Dictionary Act. There was a lot of questions about uh, the Dictionary Act, whether it should apply or uh, when it shouldn't. There were lots of questions for um, petitioner um, for the government about, or sorry, for the petitioner about. Um, why uh, the, the Dictionary Act should be followed when other provisions of patent law don't, uh, don't define persons as excluding the government. There, there's a section 102 which says um, uh, persons um, that are bringing prior art, it's been broadly applied to the government. And so there, there were a lot of questions for the petitioner about why we should do it here where we haven't done it in other areas of patent law. And then on the other side, for the government, there were lots of questions about um, what, it, what context uh, they could point to which, uh, which made this, other than uh, the government being like everyone else, um, which made um, 
the Dictionary Act not apply to this case. And so um, any sense of uh, who got the better of the argument here, who the justices were kind of um, more critical of, or um, I mean, which side of the argument really uh, did the, the justices seem to uh, grapple uh, onto, do you think? I thought um, that Malcolm Stewart, on behalf of the government, made an interesting point. Now, of course, he was pounced on, I think it's fair to say, by Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, who, uh, as I said earlier, had, had a particular uh, view. But he took this idea of presumption. And, and if you accept for a moment my differentiation between government as plaintiff and government as defendant, or government as beneficiary and government uh, suffering a detriment, he said, um, essentially, he, he sort of flipped it and said, not allowing the government to have the benefit of this, everybody acknowledges, streamlined procedure that was developed in a statutory scheme in an effort to, uh, to overcome uh, significant problems that were embedded in the scheme before that. Not allowing the government this, this benefit is something we ought not to presume. It's just as if Congress were uh, creating a higher standard of proof for the government than for private litigants. And I thought that was an interesting, he sort of flipped the clear statement requirement. If, if you are going to disadvantage the government in this way, you ought to be required to do so forthrightly. I thought that was an interesting way to, to approach the sovereign immunity issue. Yeah, if I could just add on to that point. I. I took that from their brief as well, a real sort of uh, changing of the narrative. And I think um, that's, it's it's very clever. One thing I did notice, and and uh, I'd be curious, I'd be curious to see um, what if others, if others notice this as well, they don't make the argument that they actually survive the presumption, um, which is, you know, typically when you, you have a, an argument, uh, you know, a statutory question, you know, if there's a presumption, you say, well, it doesn't apply. And by the way, we win anyway. Um, but to me, that was noticeably absent from, from this brief. And, you know, the, the SG's office um, will often sort of not go as far as other litigants in terms of making an argument that's maybe a little bit implausible. Um, but to me, uh, I, I thought it was interesting that they sort of really hung their hats on the presumption just doesn't apply here. Um, and of course, they're, they have uh, sound rationale for that. Um, but, you know, given the, that it is a longstanding presumption, it did strike me as surprising that they didn't sort of make the additional argument that they could, they could overcome it. Or maybe this is just a different way of saying we overcome it, but as a matter of statutory, as a matter of statutory yeah, text. I, 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 I felt the same way. That, uh, there were a number of times the justices asked uh, the government to give them the context uh, that they would overcome this argument. And they really just um, weaseled around and made the argument that, well, it doesn't apply because there are all these other provisions which um, aren't consistent with uh, uh, the Dictionary Act, and so you can't apply it here. But I didn't, I, I agree with you. I didn't hear them making the argument that, oh, well, um, even, if, even if the Dictionary Act does apply, here's the context that indicates otherwise. Um, Charles? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, it's always hard to tell kind of what motivates the government. They may have had, you know, other statutory yep. concerns that, that may have led to that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting that they seemed to more or less be going for an argument that was, you know, I think along the lines of what Justice Kagan was receptive to toward the end, that, look, it just doesn't make sense to have this presumption anymore. That might actually be what they're trying to go for in the act, that they would prefer that 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 statutes just be interpreted on their faces rather than based on based on the presumption of the Dictionary Act. Um, I think the other interesting thing that I noticed from the argument um, was sort of this this interest in what the the practical effect of treating the government as a person or not as a person would have. Um, toward the beginning of the petitioner's argument, there was um, there was a discussion that you know the government doesn't really need to be able to participate in um, the AIA patent review proceedings because they can always take advantage of the sua sponte patent reexamination proceedings um, under Section 303 of the Patent Act, which allows the director of the patent office to just say we are going to reconsider a, a patent. Um, this was actually um, something of the discussion of that, that I had in my amicus brief, so I was fairly happy to have seen that people were talking about this. Um, but this led Justice Alito immediately to ask a question of, is that such a great idea? 
because in, in his view, and you know, there were quite a few questions that kind of came out of his, his initial point, what the petitioner is essentially proposing is that a federal agency such as the post office should pick up the telephone and call the director of the patent office and say, hey, would you mind re-examining this patent? And the director would you know, make some sort of judgment about that. Um, and in Justice Alito's view, and in the view of several other justices, this just seemed somewhat unbecoming. It seemed very non-transparent and a little too backroom dealing. Um, I th um, there was a there there were there was a question I think from I'm on the wrong page. I think it was from Justice Soto or sorry, this was from Justice Ginsburg. Um, you know, why would a rational Congress allow for the government to take advantage of the sort of like ex parte back room arrangement, but not allow a more robust adversarial process? It doesn't make any sense why Congress it makes oh sorry, this was Justice Gorsuch actually. Um, who said, maybe you can imagine Congress just saying that the government should never be able to ask for re-examination of a patent in any context. Um, you could see why that would be problematic. But if Congress is going to allow one, it seems like a bad idea to let them have the less transparent um, one that, that doesn't involve a, a clear adversarial process. So you know, I think that that theme um, really s stuck through a lot of the petitioner's argument. Strangely, it didn't stick when it came to the government side. When the government came to argue, most of the questions were about the estoppel provision. Um, as the petitioner has point put pointed out, the government is not subject to the same sort of estoppel as a private litigant would be if a private litigant filed for an IPR or other AI review proceedings. And the petitioner said, this is just unfair, and that's a good reason not to treat the government as able to use the AI proceedings, because the government ends up with just the benefit, whereas everybody else gets the benefit and the detriment of the estoppel. And um, there were quite a few questions about this. Justice Alito went on for a while saying, um, you know, doesn't this, doesn't it seem unfair? Can you give any reason why Congress would have wanted something? But he said something very indicative when he was um, asking that question. He said, you know, to the extent that we believe the legal fiction that Congress even gave a second of thought to the statute, and I think that really, you know, gives us what's going on here. I think all of the justices realize this is just a mistake. Congress should have thought about this sort of problem and didn't. And the question is, when you know that Congress has made a mistake, and it seems like there are, it seems like all of your options are problematic in some direction, what do you do as a court? And that's a difficult problem. I think that they were really looking for guidance. Do you follow a presumption that doesn't seem to get you to a result that um, Justice Kagan necessarily likes? Do you just impose the court's own view where Congress may have intended something else? It's it's very hard to say, and I think that that's, you know, that was really the theme that I saw them struggling with throughout this argument. I was really surprised that Justice Alito seemed troubled by any estoppel point, given that he's the author of B and B Hardware, uh, in which he, in a very analogous Lanham Act context, said that principles of common law estoppel would absolutely govern in, in subsequent proceedings. So, to me, with that solid backdrop, there ought to have been nothing especially problematic about the differentiation in the estoppel here. Yeah, and I think that the government's um, answer was, look, we're still subject to some sort of estoppel. Um, you know, may, may be enough to, to convince them that that's not a problem. I think the, the larger tenor of Alito's question was, we're just stuck between a rock and a hard place here. There's clearly you know, not necessarily a good answer, and we're going to have to deal with some oddity regardless of what we're deciding. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's fair, and and it did strike me personally, sort of reading the government's response to the estoppel question, that that's all fine and good as a policy matter, but it doesn't address the statutory flaw. It does not explain why you would have this omission of any suit against the government, and if you know you're reading the statute the way the petitioner wants you to, it's it's that omission, not the practical effect of that omission, that should teach how we read the term person. So um, you know, I think Alito is is. A, a good textualist in, in many senses, um, and I would suspect that the that it's hard to write an opinion that ex that explains that away. And even saying, you know, as a practical matter, the government will still be subject to common law estoppel. Um, while it might help and it might avoid some of the practical consequences, it's it's tough to write around that as a matter of statutory construction. But he arguably did in B and B. Yeah. Uh, first, and then second, uh, you know, it. 
a lot of petitioner's argument hinges on the idea, how could Congress possibly have intended person given this super huge gap in the estoppel operation? And so if there's this presumptive common law backdrop of estoppel, which he was willing to find in the Lanham Act, possibly it becomes less of a, a, a big problematic thorny statutory red flag. Great, so there's a lot of threads I wanna pick up here, but I wanna just turn, uh, give everyone an opportunity to ask questions. So if you wanna ask questions, the mics are down here in front, just come on down, I'll turn it over to you. Um, so while we're waiting for questions, um, let, let me pick up on uh, the Gorsuch uh, Kavanaugh exchange. It, it's a long, long exchange. It takes about four or five pages um, of, of the briefs. Kagan jumps in a little bit, uh, Lito's there a little bit, and really uh, it's about, uh, uh, Lizzie and I talked uh, before, is the chicken uh, hen house problem, right? The, the wolf in the hen house problem. Like, um, is there a problem having um, a government agency litigating before another government agency? And so um, this is a big concern for Kavanaugh and Gorsuch particularly. Um, what did you make of this? Did you, did you uh, were they arguing for a future case or were they concerned about that um, in this case? I thought that argument was something Kagan was more interested in. That's sort of the second argument in the Cato brief. I thought Gorsuch and Kavanaugh were more interested in that unitary executive issue. Um, but. I thought that the government had a fairly decent response when it said, um, you know, Congress didn't appear to have problems with the federal government appearing before the PTO in every other uh, respect and, and did not create a separate mechanism by which government could get patents. But be curious to hear Martine's point. Um, I. I don't know if it's a question for another case so much as, I mean, this is obviously something that is of, of major interest to these justices in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, like good lawyers, I think they have fun with these cases. And, uh, you know, whether or not it's, the, it ultimately becomes the decisive point because you have to get, you know, five or more. And, and this is a little bit of an odd duck argument. Um, you know, comes out in the amicus briefs, but but not so much in the parties' briefs, um, which are more focused on the statutory question. So whether it will ultimately be decisive, um, I think is is questionable, and and my assumption, my guess would be probably not. Um, but you certainly might see it in in another writing. Um, and it is very much the case that that these themes, whether they emerge just at argument, whether they emerge in dissents or in concurrences, um, or uh, you know, possibly in the majority, but um, they will definitely become jumping off points for future cases. And we have seen this so many times where something somebody says at argument or somebody says um, either in a focused way or even in an offhanded way in an opinion um, will become the, the starting point for future litigation, for future arguments made on these issues. So whether there will ultimately be a separation of powers argument made about this or some version of that uh, remains to be seen, but I think it's definitely possible. So it's interesting that it was um, Justices Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Kagan who are the subject of discussion with regard to this because um, when I was researching my amicus brief, I went off on this very long and not necessarily profitable tangent of research um, in which I was looking up the, uh, the unitary executive theory. Um, this is the theory by which the president basically is the unitary executive and has the power to direct um, agency heads on their, on their actions as opposed to, you know, what, um, I, I, th I think Kagan calls the conventional view, which is that um, individual agency heads are delegated the responsibility by Congress to make decisions, and the president can use oversight or can use removal power, but cannot actually tell them what to do. Um, this is a this is a hotly topic, hotly debated topic in the literature, and hasn't come to the court since Youngstown Steel. So I mean, you know, it's it's kind of, it, it shows up in some places, but I, you know, I think that there's a lot of interest and it hasn't been commensurate with the amount of attention that the Supreme Court itself has been able to give it. But you do have three justices who have expressed a lot of interest in this. Um, Justice Kavanaugh wrote a number of opinions on the DC circuit regarding the, um, 
um, regard, regarding the unitary executive theory. Um, I forget where Justice Gorsuch is interested in it comes from, but I know that he has expressed interest, I think, in law review articles. And Justice Kagan, of course, famously wrote her presidential administration article in which she argued that both the unitary executive theory and the conventional view are wrong, but then posits another theory by which the president has the power to direct agencies of Congress and what they're doing. Um, so I think that this, this has sort of a tangential implication for this case, insofar as if you accept a unitary executive theory or you generally think that the president has the authority to direct the, the, the actions of agencies, then it doesn't really make sense for a court to be doing that same job. And that's where the this dialogue between Malcolm Stewart for the SG's office and Justices Kavanaugh and, um, and, and Gorsuch came from. I think part of that dialogue was because I, I got the sense that um, that Mr. Stewart somewhat misunderstood Justice Gorsuch's question um, and thought he was asking why the government should be allowed to come before the PTAB, whereas I'm pretty sure Gorsuch was asking about whether why the government should be allowed to litigate against the patent office. And so that led to some amount of um, that, that led to some amount of confusion, which um, ultimately um, Malcolm Stewart was able to resolve by coming back to the question of, and then you know we would eventually appeal, and you know this is why that would not be so unusual. But that was you know that that was certainly a question. I think it's um, in large part because it's just a very interesting question of what what happens when parts of the executive branch end up disagreeing. I have to confess, I am myself confused by by the question uh, as posed by Justice Gorsuch because to me. PTAB is acting in a role as arbiter. It is not a party. And, and I think to understand this as government versus government, you have to sort of give PTAB a role that I don't understand it to exercise in this particular context, um, which is why, for me, the argument that appealed to Justice Kagan, the fox guarding hen house argument, was a little bit more accessible. Yep, we got a question from the audience. It's great. Well, one thing, one thing that I thought was pretty noticeable is just how um, all the justices in this question have a special job. All of them ask questions, and every single one of them are just addressing the issue of law, and then some might be rebuttal. So I thought that was a very interesting thing. I mean, these questions are provided in that line, but I thought it was an interesting dialogue between the justices. So who writes the opinion? Hmm. Who writes the opinion? <laughs> well, Thomas has done all the other patent yeah. opinions. <laughs> uh, I mean, he, his body language showed that he was interested, and he actually moved over and, and, and said something and brought it. Mm -hmm. They love their little side conversations. Yeah. It's one of my favorite things to do when I go to the courts, watch the way they talk to each other, because they, um, their, their friendliness is, is um, really apparent. Um, yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. It will depend on a number of factors, including how the rest of the opinions from this sitting shake out. So, by sort of tradition, um, commonly the the opinions will be assigned fairly evenly among the nine um, from each sitting. There'll be more than nine cases um, in in the February, or I guess more than the March. Are we technically in the March sitting or in the February sitting? It's, it gets confusing. I guess we're in the February sitting, even though um, it's later than usual. Um, so. That will depend on uh, where the majorities land in the other cases, um, and then uh, by seniority. So it's sort of anyone's guess at this point. I think um, Thomas writing many of the patent opinions uh, may be a feature of the fact that he has unique views on a lot of the more controversial cases, and therefore is more <coughs> likely to be a lone voice rather than a majority voice, whereas in the patent cases, uh, he's less likely, and we've talked a little bit about, at least among ourselves, that this isn't really a typical patent case, so it's more of a statutory case. But um, I think the reason that he has shaken out to be the majority writer in a lot of the patent cases is in part because, as I was just explaining with the feature of there trying to be a uh, uniformity or an evenness in, the in who writes what, um, he is not as typically as others in the majority and more, more often speaks for himself. So patent cases tend to be a place where they sort of coalesce and there you have it. <laughs> The other, another question was, um, so I was always wondering, 
Well, it'll be an interesting test of how important that presumption of validity is in the um, in, in the courts as opposed to before the patent office, because um, in the court of claims, right, the um, the presumption would be that the patent is valid and that um, clear and convincing evidence is necessary. Whereas with the PTAB, they only need a presumption. So theoretically, it could be the case that the court of claims says, well, you know, the PTAB decided under a um, under a preponderance of the evidence standard, but we think that that evidence fell within the margin, so it doesn't quite reach clear and convincing, and therefore the patent remains valid. Um, that being said, my recollection of return mail or of the government's petition was that they had three or four grounds for um, the CBM for CBM review, of which the of which the PTAB only granted one, I think, <coughs> uh, one or two, because of the fact that they they thought the others were duplicative. So it could end up being that the government just ends up going with a different ground. Yeah, and oftentimes these are just, um, the patent battle is just trying to get a settlement value. So they, they have a ruling that the government is not allowed to uh, go to the AIA, and they have to go to court to get this patent invalidated. It might be more beneficial to the government, uh, probably a private party more likely, but the government might be more willing to settle for uh, $100,000, um, which would cost much less than litigating this patent in court. Um, so th sometimes those, that's the strategy. It's not just, am I going to win the case? It's, can I get a settlement uh, if I get a reversal? And if I ask for a comment, I read the briefs very carefully. But I thought it was a slam dunk suit for the government to get the ruling. But I have to say the advocate for uh, the uh, for, uh, return mail did a good job. I was thinking that she might very well win this. She's Beth Franklin. Yeah, yeah. She, <laughs> she, she's a, a very formidable advocate. Yeah. So, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, because you're no one's uh, actual party, uh, I, I hope you will engage me in doing some vote counting. So um, do you think any justices, I mean, um, Thomas is out, because you can't ever predict him, um, but did justices tip their hands in a way that makes you think um, they're gonna come out one way or the other? If I had to predict, I would call this a five and three in one case. Okay. Um, for respondent. Okay. Uh, and I would put in my five RBG, Breyer, Alito, Sotomayor, and Thomas. Um, strange bedfellows, but on this statutory context, in, um, in, in, in the three, I would put Chief Justice Roberts with Gorsuch and Kavanaugh, and then I would have Kagan out on her own, possibly with the hen house argument. I think I generally agree with that. I think <coughs> Kagan had the most trouble with this case because on the one hand, I think that she saw the force of the logic that Alito was putting forward. Like this is just so odd to say that the government shouldn't be allowed to do this, but they are allowed to do this other really not savory sounding thing. But she really likes she really likes reading the text as the text, and you do have the text there that says that you should you should follow a presumption. Um, and I, I you know I think that her question to the government of where is your affirmative argument here? Where is your where is your context that actually shows in the statutory language that you should win? Was was really telling of um, how much trouble she was having. She was really looking for that argument. I, I think she was hoping it would come out of what was the the two seventy or 257 arguments that she was making. Um, she was hoping that they would bring that up. But yeah, the, the sense I got was that she was probably struggling the most in terms of what's a way to, um, to get to yes on that. Um, I think that a lot of the others tended to just agree more with that Alito reasoning that it would just be very strange to say that the government shouldn't be able to do this or that the text um, seems to be, it, it seems to be perfectly fine to read um, the Patent Act the way it does and then I'm sure that Gorsuch and Kagan will, or Gorsuch and Kavanaugh will try to find a way to put executive power into this because um, it's, it really is such an interesting question um, that you know, I, I'll, I'll be interested in seeing what they have to say kind of regardless of how this comes out because I just want to know kind of what the future directions of the court will be. Uh, yeah, with the caveat that um, I think it's really, really tough um, without having heard, um, and I was not at the court this morning, um, uh, I think I, these statutory cases are great for strange bedfellows um, and great for really, really interesting and well-written and well-thought-out opinions. 
I think you very well might get a unanimous court um, on a on a narrow statutory uh, statutory interpretation interpretation that sort of has uh, caveats or uh, and by I say unanimous, I don't necessarily mean one opinion, um, but uh, you know I could see this space of executive authority being more of a well, not in this case. Um, you know, <coughs> maybe it's not such a big deal here, but concurrence type thing. And when I say uh, you could get to a unanimous, unanimous court, I think these cases, in addition to being great for really great opinions, are also really great for um, not knowing exactly where everyone's going to shake out because they're close. They're, they're just, you know, people might have very strong views and they might not have very strong views. So you can kind of, these are the cases where sometimes coming out of conference you're very surprised because people were really skeptical, but ultimately they got, they ended up one way or the other and people sort of coalesce, coalesce around an opinion that just makes sense. Um, but they might be very, very skeptical, or you might end up with a 5-4. Like, you can get them, you know, there's some cases that are very broadly divided, um, and then there are some cases that are, you know, you end up with 5-4, but everyone really could have shifted around and gone the other way, and it was just kind of like, at the end of the day, you sort of throw up your hands and go, I don't know, one, one is just a little bit better than the other. I mean, I think I'll, I'll just say very quickly, um, comparing this to the uh, Helsin versus Teva case, which was argued recently, um, in that case, you know, you could see a very clear out for the court, right? Yeah. The, the Solicitor General conceded that if you, if, if you assume that Congress wrote um, Section 102 with respect to, you know, historical, historical practice and the historical practice was well set, then the government loses. And they, they basically took that concession from the government and wrote an opinion saying, well, the government conceded that, and we think that the history is correct, so, you know, the end finds your opinion. Yeah. I didn't think I saw the same sort of out in mm -hmm. this case, which I think is going to make it a lot more difficult. So we're probably not going to see an opinion coming out within a month in the same way that we did for Helsin. Yeah. Um, and I think it is, you know, as we were saying, going to be a very well thought out, um, interestingly reasoned reason piece. Um, with that, uh, we'll exit for food uh, and drinks in the other room. So please welcome, please join me in thanking our panel uh, for a great discussion. Hey, Martin. Thank nice you so much, very nice to yeah. meet you. I wasn't sure I'd remember you after all that. Yeah, no, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. So remind me, I'm sorry. Um, no, I'm that means, uh, Thursday? Yeah, Thursday morning. It's okay. a 2v2. Yeah, I was just so curious. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, if, if the yeah. school closes, like I said, we still could come in and play cells. Yeah. So they're not no, on we, the school. No, we can come into the school. Hey, can I introduce you to John Summers? This is done. one Hi. of my Hi. students. How are you doing? Good. Matthew is a first year student, and he's pursuing uh, patent law. Okay. Well, see. And I, you just said uh, you interviewed him. Yeah. So who are you interviewing with? Oh, okay. Yeah? <laughs> uh, actually, at one point, Matthew was my first year. Uh-huh. Uh, Alan. Uh-huh. Right? Because you wanted to spark something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I can't talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> What's your background? Uh, computer science. Oh, okay, all right. Because actually, see, I'm the black sheep of my family because my father's an EE, my brother is an ME, my older sister is a computer engineer, my younger sister is a PhD in EE, and then marries the EE professor instead. So. <laughs> so. And you, what was your background? Uh, economics, anthropology. <laughs> well, actually, I started with violin uh -huh. as my major, and then I'm uh, much better at being a lawyer than a and so, uh, so I went to Indiana, and uh, even in law, I sort of figured I was going to, at first I thought I was going to do labor relations because I had done a summer project for public sector labor relations in Indiana, and then I was in communication, so I clerked for the Federal Communications Commission. So it was only sort of by accident or else genetics because my father is, uh, was a patent agent. So mm -hmm. he always used to have to come to D.C. because back then that was the only way you could do mm -hmm. your searches. Yeah, so that's good. Good luck. So anyway, he's in my IP class, and he's been telling me some stories about the argument tomorrow morning and the yeah. lunch talk. Yeah. And, you, know, you are. <laughs>
I know the smell. Which I can't believe. I mean, it looks. You know, it I looks... know. I keep looking out the window saying no. Uh, but yeah. then you also have the high of 35 and low of 34. It's like I've never seen such yeah, a small I know. temperature we range. Get such an enormous <laughs> one too. So I'm going to have to look at the yeah. be careful with my time. I would like to say I'll still this. I still can come and meet okay. with people. Okay. So that, so we can get into the building. I can get into the building. I can, I've already heard from Tom Hanks. Yeah. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And he can get in. Even if you have it. I might not be able to get out of okay. like my driveway, and okay. so I might not be able to get in. Um, he's, and I explained to him like what I'm doing. Yeah. And I haven't heard from the two Eric's that I know. Uh, you know Pelton, yeah. You know Eric Pelton. Yeah. Okay. The other one seems very young, but I assume he's uh, what he does. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's young. I mean, the, the two Eric's are trademark prosecution lawyers. Which, which I don't view this as a trademark case, actually. First Amendment case. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, but I that's think my trademark background justices, informs it. That's how the justices are going to be looking at this. But that's I think it informs it because, you know, as to the vagueness and, you know, whether you're regulating speech or not, knowing what the trademark office does. Yeah. And because, like, especially the vagueness, because, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing as you discover these things as you write the brief. And, like, one of the things, you know, I focused on, well, you got the examining attorney who has been a very experienced. And then you have the law office manager, presumably, because yeah. that's what the rule says. Mm -hmm. And then uh, you have the uh, pre-publication review. So you have all these people look at it. So, you know, maybe they're all wrong, but doesn't that go to, you know, the vagueness of the standards if you can have three experienced people look at it and be wrong? The other thing I just realized, and I wrote it as a footnote, and it's like and one of my friends says, you know, I think this is important. You know, this, in, 19, 20, uh, in 2017, the government says it's what I call the PEA, uh, sexual. But then the TMAP gets revised in 2018, and it's still the old language. So which is it? Is it scandalous that covers everything, including religion, politics, uh, social mores, as well as PES? Or is it the Department of Justice version? If the Department of Commerce and the Department of Justice can't agree on what the statute means, how does that give reasonable notice to the public? They're the experts, and they can't even figure it out. So I was yeah. so when I saw, oh god, this 2018 version. Because at first I was like, well, which version do I quote? You know, the version at the time we got reviewed, and that's how I sort of got. This is how you just spend time looking at things. Eventually, things pop out. So it's like, so my first question was, what version do I quote of the TMEP? It's like, oh, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> and so there's some other things like that that are sort of like I think are pretty good arguments. That you know, I only sort of 